Up to the present time, we have approached our Greek problem largely diagrammatically, or in the effort to outline some elements of the pantheon and the outer structure of the religion. Uh, to most students of Greek philosophy, this has been enough, because in our modern Western life, we are not accustomed to a divided theology. That is, we are not accustomed to the idea that there is one obvious doctrine, and behind it another not obvious, and not always identical with the exterior part. Ancient peoples did not demand that their outer and inner religions be identical. They demanded, however, that the outer religion should lead naturally toward the inner religion, and that nothing learned exteriorly should conflict with that which is later discovered to be true interiorly. Thus, the outer fables and garments formed a vestment within a living body far more important than the robe which it wore. And in effort to attempt a, a summary of some of the elements of this, we are going to approach phases of Greek theology tonight which come very close uh, to some of our so-called esoteric systems in the world, uh, particularly Vedanta, Yoga, and Northern Buddhism. Uh, essentially to point out not the parallels between one faith and another, but to point out the largeness, uh, the unfolding sufficiency of the Greek religion itself for those who lived under it and attempted to rise to a better way of life according to its teachings. It is quite obvious that the noblest of the Greeks must have had certain inner consolation beyond mythology, and that pure intellection was not the source of this consolation. For well, in almost every instance they clearly reveal not only the breadth and depth of their thinking, but the sublimity of their spiritual convictions. These convictions must flow from and be supported by an adequate an adequate religion, uh, a sufficient and proper participation in spiritual value. So we're going to uh, approach some of the side issues of this uh, in an effort to clarify our principal point. And we will begin by a study of the natal demon as it is found in Greek philosophy. Now in the dictionary, if you will look up the word daemon or demon, D-A-E-M-O-N, you will find that it does not mean a devil or an imp of darkness. The word means originally, and so the dictionary tells us, it meant a deity of a secondary or tutelary order, and it also meant a spirit. It is only by extension that the word came to have any implication of demon as we commonly use it today. For many years, I made a point of dividing the pronunciation, calling one our familiar term, the term demon, and the Greek form daimon or daemon. The dictionary, however, prefers us to use the same pronunciation. But let us bear in mind that this evening, wherever we use the word demon, we are using it in the Greek sense, as a god, and not as an evil being. Only in passing may we mention that the transforming of the Greek divinities into demons was largely the result of the rise of Christian theology in which it was sincerely believed that these older gods were false, that those who followed them worshipped false gods and were led astray by infernal forces, it being assumed that these gods were really devils in disguise. This was a medieval theological thought, which I think it is perhaps well time for us to outgrow. Uh, the word demon, therefore, simply means a certain kind of God. Perhaps the most famous historical example of this is the demon of Socrates. This was an invisible spirit who counseled the philosopher throughout his life, who formed a source of oracular revelation 
and who was his consoler, friend, confidant, and guardian through the many long years of his troubled earthly ministry. That Socrates would have chosen an evil spirit to be his guardian is utterly out of key with the nature of the man, nor should we assume that this spirit was regarded as some Mephistopheles to an ancient Grecian Faust. Such is not the intent. Uh, what uh, Socrates is talking about is the natal demon, and this therefore will be the first thing that we will uh, attempt to understand. The Pythagoreans and the other Greeks tell us that the numerical power of the demon is six. And you will find that in Plato and many other writings, numbers become exceedingly significant. The reason why this demon is six is because it represents a being or power that is the result of an aggregate of six factors, elements or parts. When we look into the constitution of man, searching for this natal demon that might have been lurking in the background of the constitution of Socrates, we realize that there is only one structure in man that precisely fulfills both the physical and metaphysical implications of a six-fold entity in man. And that is, of course, what we call today the human ego personality. This personality, as Buddha points out, is the aggregate of the six sense machine. In other words, it consists of the five senses and the mental element. These together constitute a kind of being. And for the most persons, this kind of being is the only being that they know. Now, we might go a little further. The average person, in relation to this six-fold being in himself, though he lives with it and is in constant communion with it, and it participates in every function of his life, the average person is unaware of its nature and only occasionally responsive to its true inclinations and impulses. We live in constant conflict with ourselves. And as St. Paul says, when we would do good, evil is ever nigh unto us. We have a terrible time even living up to the natural advice and admonition of our own compound intellectual entity. So we live below ourselves almost constantly. We live less than we know to be right. We live contrary what we, to what we know to be prudent. We perform actions which we know to be dangerous to our lives, our health, and our happiness, thus constantly entering into a state of conflict with even the aggregate which we call ourselves. This uh, means, to a degree, that what uh, Socrates knew as his natal demon represents the structure of experienced consciousness arising out of man's sensory contact with externals and his contemplative reflection upon contact. In other words, we live every day in a world of experiences. These move in upon us. Perhaps subconsciously they move in more than we realize. And this internal self grows more rapidly than the external, possessing a greater body of knowledge than the external realizes that the internal nature actually does possess. The Greeks also had a certain further thinking about this, to the effect that, as Buddha pointed out, this complex of the sixth sense machine, because it is the basic cause of rebirth, constitutes, as the Tibetan points out, the continuity between lives. Consequently, the individual who possesses the sense of self-existence is perpetuated from one corporeal body to another simply because of his dominant acceptance of the fact of self-existence. It might follow, as the uh, Neoplatonist uh, reason, therefore, that the natal demon can be not only this aggregate as we know it today, 
but the aggregate of karmic accumulation. It can be that which we have been in relation to what we are, causing some of the Greeks to refer to this demon as conscience. Conscience being, in a sense, therefore, man's overknowing in relation to his present doing, which if out of harmony therewith can also be the immediate cause of psychic stress. This uh, concept is sufficiently interesting to us or perhaps uh, the purpose of exploring it a little further. And in order to simplify this and make it as brief as possible, I want to read a few lines from a paragraph in our lectures on ancient philosophy relating to this particular subject. Here we have Apuleius uh, writing in his commentary on the God of Socrates and uh, paraphrasing the teachings or words of Plato. And then here's what he tells us concerning the peculiar demon that is allotted to every man who is a witness and guardian of his conduct in life, who without being visible to any is always present, and who is an arbitrator not only of his deeds but also of his thoughts. Then we will skip a little and read on. All of you, therefore, who hear this divine opinion of Plato, as interpreted by me, so form your minds to whatever you may do, or to whatever may be the subject of your meditations, that you may know that there is nothing concealed from those guardians, that is, from these demons, either within the mind or external to it, but that the demon who presides over you inquisitively participates in all that concerns you, sees all things, understands all things, and in the place of conscience dwells in the most profound recesses of the mind. For he of whom I speak is a perfect guardian, a singular prefect, a domestic speculator, a proper curator, an intimate inspector, an assiduous observer, an inseparable arbiter, a reprobator of all that is evil, an approval, approver of all that is good. And if he is legitimately attended to, sedulously known, and religiously worshipped in the way in which he was reverenced by Socrates, with justice and innocence, will be a predictor of things uncertain, a premonitor of things dubious, a defender of things dangerous, and an assistant in all time of want. And that is the definition of the function or action of this demon. Let us therefore contemplate the Platonic concept, which incidentally later came down into the church, which though it had no time for demons, did develop out of the Assyrian Chaldean concept, which was likewise supported by the Egyptians, that man is born with a kind of an attendant spirit. This is called in uh, medieval Christianity the guardian angel. And under the definition of the guardian angel in the canons of the faith, it is stated that the belief in such a being, though not canonical, that is, not official or sanctified by theological legislation, that such belief is of the mind of the Church. That is, that it has been generally and universally accepted, and those believing in it are in no way subject to rebuke by the Church. Now, the guardian angel and the uh, natal demon of Socrates represent, therefore, essentially one thing. They represent the level of the mental entity conscience and consciousness of the individual, the level which apparently is his present level, but the level to which factually he has not generally ascended. In other words, the individual has not reached identity with himself even as a corporeal, objective person. He is not using his own thoughts as fully as possible. 
He is not living as well as he knows. He is not thinking as truly as he is capable of thinking. Therefore, in relationship to his conduct, as it is daily expressed in action, the natal demon signifies a level above his normal reaction to things. Thus we find in the Socratic concept that the first labor of man in his ascent of the mysterious ladder of unfolding union toward the gods, that the first step of this descent is that the individual shall come into harmonic integration with what might be termed the common level of his own capacity. To do this, he must be as Socrates was, honest, fearless, uh, free from all inclination to mental subterfuge, not given to equivocation, free from compromise, and dedicated wholly and completely uh, to the conduct of his own affairs according to the convictions of his own conscience. To achieve this is to result, therefore, in a general purification or catharsis of his nature, by means of which he becomes that which he already is capable of becoming. He gains the power to make use of his faculties, the normal and common faculties of his time. For you will remember that Socrates made a great deal of the fact that he was in no way a superior person. He was no way divinely endowed. He possessed no strange powers which transcended the abilities of common men. He thought not with a brilliance or a profundity in the common sense of the word. He thought with a strange, almost cataclysmic directness. He thought with the wonderful capacity that so few of us have of taking two and two and putting them together and making four. Something that is very difficult for us to do. We nearly always can put two and two together and get some kind of a mysterious multiple which satisfies our feelings but is contrary to our facts. If then we should come to the conclusion that by the demon is signified the mental complex of man abiding constantly with him, associated with him in all things, and according to Iamblichus and the mysteries of the Chaldeans, that after death this demon becomes the conductor of the soul, bringing it before the gods and testifying to the attainments of that soul, incapable of being deceived or having concealed from it any fact relating to that soul. In other words, that man, no matter how he conducts himself or what he does, must in the fullness of time, as Socrates pointed out, come face to face with himself and must accept the final judgment of himself upon himself. This is the judgment of the demon. And perhaps it does take on a slightly morbid and infernal situation when some individuals having that long heart-to-heart -heart talk with themselves find it a most unpleasing experience. But so often in life, we are plagued by our own conscience. And we wish sometimes that we could dismiss it, or would like to regard it as an imp of perdition, prodding us to things we do not wish to do. Now we have therefore now established a level, the Socratic level, the level which is the first common labor of man. And that is the bringing of the objective personality of the individual into a harmonic accord, the union of the six powers to produce within themselves that rather simple, but by very simplicity, beyond deception, part of man's nature. Now in this the Greeks differ somewhat from the Oriental. 
The Oriental assumes, or at least he has assumed to assume, that the products of this natal demon are essentially illusionary. Therefore, that the sixth sensory machine cannot produce anything but karmic continuance of the organism. The Greek does not deny this, but he makes a useful and practical observation, namely that a man must walk before he can fly, and that before the individual can transcend all the limits of illusion and go into the noblest spheres of reality, it is first necessary for him to live well in the conditioned state in which he finds himself, attaining release by outgrowing rather than by attempting to discard the machinery of the sensory perceptions. That only when he has satisfied the demands of these faculties, has exhausted their natural contribution, and has attained a certain quietude in the presence of them, so that he may discriminate them honorably and honestly, and learn that it is not essentially the machine itself which is bad. It is the product of the machine in the term of the distortion which man permits to arise in the development of his mental-emotional structure. Beyond this, then, we pass to the next part of this, and you will see as we go along why it has a direct bearing upon the subject listed in the program, in case you think we've forgotten it. This second part is the next level in the Socratic and Greek theology, namely that above the natal demon there is a second entity or being which is called the essential demon. Now the essential demon is perhaps <coughs> most uh, com comparable to Emerson's concept of the overself. The essential demon consists of the extension of the natal demonic power upward in a union with that directly superior to itself. If therefore we should take the state of thought or the mental life of man and cause that man to uh, that mental life to ascend to the next level superior to itself. We might even uh, begin to develop a series of Neoplatonic analogies. For here we have in the Neoplatonic philosophy thought ascending toward reason, knowledge rising to union with wisdom. Intellect ascending to the contemplative state of understanding. We therefore push all of these values upward, and we come upon a new kind of self, and that is the self above and beyond the intellectual self, and that is the intuitional self. The intuitional self, as the essential demon, therefore constitutes a still higher order of deities. And now we come to an interesting thought in connection with the Greek mythology, namely that the deities are also assigned to the levels of human consciousness, ascending the ladder in a natural and orderly manner, and that the conditions which we call levels of consciousness the Greeks knew as bodies or areas of divine beings. The essential demon is, of course, more remote and more difficult than the natal demon. I think we have a parallel to it in the Chinese doctrine of the transcendent being as set forth in The Secret of the Golden Flower by Willing. Here we have the Chinese recognizing that within the nature of man there is a quality or condition by means of which an imminent and immediate transcendence is possible, and that man also possesses this kind of a God, a God possessing such qualities or attributes as omniscience, omnipotence, omniactivity, 
that this is the being who knows all, hears all, sees all, from which man can never depart, either in life or in death, and to which man must turn with a certain assurance that whereas his body is sustained by certain outwards, his inner life is sustained by those farther fountains flowing from the transcendent being, and that is, he is nourished upwardly by the food which enters his body, by the air that he breathes, by water, and by all the emanations of physical nature around him. So he is nourished from above downwardly by a water of life, a mysterious elixir, a wonderful and sovereign remedy this true water of life flowing from the fountains of eternity, and those who drink thereof shall not thirst again. So the father fountains of the Chaldean Oracle represent not only gods in the sky, or universal deities, or principles abiding in the abstract polydimensional space around us. They represent attributes and qualities of our own composite internal. And man is nourished essentially from within his own nature, even as his body is sustained by things outwardly. His outer mind is sustained from without by observation and experience and experimentation, producing the natal demon. His inner mind is nourished by inspiration, intuition, and participation in divine mysteries. And this flows from within himself, downward, gradually into the cognizable parts of his own consciousness. Now this might sound like a rather long sentence, and I'm afraid it is, but I believe that uh, the words may be a little tumbling about, but the idea is not particularly difficult. It is uh, perhaps difficult because I'm trying to put it somewhat in the Greek phrasing uh, rather than in our modern way of saying things. There's a certain archaic uh, majesty in these old forms, which like the uh, older type of the uh, writing of sacred writ, carries, I think, something in the soul, which the modern and modernized versions of these things are deficient in conveying. In, therefore, the development of the concept of the essential demon, we have the contemplative, meditative, metaphysical discipline life which we associate with Yoga, Vedanta, and the esoteric aspects of Buddhism and Zen. Here we have the individual challenged by what he might term his God. Now, let us escape again from another peculiarity that arises in this type of thinking, namely what many millions of people, if presented with this idea suddenly, might regard as a most terrible form of idolatry, a man worshipping himself which, of course, uh, is not the purpose at all intended in this. Actually, to the Greek, this God is the God in us, which even the most orthodox religious person will accept if it is worded differently. And Paul tells us the Christ in you, the hope of glory, and uh, no one is offended. Yet if the same believer should say, I shall pray to my Christ, he would offend. It is just the way in which the wording is given. Because we think of these principles as universal. But the Greeks knew, and we know, that we experience them as individual and personal. And we shall not yet come to a spiritual understanding of Christianity merely by historical contemplation of the mystery in Bethlehem. We will experience only this mystery by the immediate apperception of it as an internal spiritual experience within ourselves. And this spiritual experience 
uh, this atheistic state in which man is raised within himself to a divine level of himself carries the essential concept of the Greek essential demon. So the essential demon is that part of man, the oversoul, the anthropos, or the overself, which abides in illuminosity, which is truly oracular, which may be known only in meditation, which may be experienced only in purity, and which sits forever like the unknown night of the Arthurian cycle in the apparently vacant siege palace at the table of the king. This is the invisible thirteenth part of the aggregate of the round table. Thus in the ascension demon we have man coming toward or upward in the search of value. And he rises to what might be termed the periphery of his own ability to conceive the nature and state of divinity. In participation in the nature of the essential demon, man experiences deity as all wise, all good, all love, all law, all beauty, all order, and all truth. These, however, we must remember, are but the mortal vestments of eternal ideas. The term truth as a word has but slight meaning. The term truth as experienced by man has a peculiar meaning, peculiar only to man. The term good has a similar connotation, not even possessing a complete a common accord in men as to that which constitutes good. Therefore, that which is a sovereignty of good for one is a deficiency of good for another. And because conscience, intuition, inspiration, all of these faculties by which man seeks inwardly to apperceive reality, these variously exercised in various times at various places, by various persons, result in extensions of consciousness which are not identical in their symbolic interpretation into the life of the individual. Thus we may say that a Buddhist, contemplating upon the proximity of the divine, may feel, experience, and inwardly see this proximity in the form of a bodhisattva or celestial buddhistic being. Whereas under the same motivation and with the same piety and the same sincerity of inward experience, the pious Christian might behold in the same way one of his most cherished saints or the likeness of the Savior himself. Yet these are vestments. These are vestments of spiritual ideas which can only uh, come, uh, come to the individual through such garments, forms, and interpretations as are supplied by his own instruments, particularly his visualizing, interpreting instruments. For he cannot give form to things which for him have no form, and he cannot bestow unknown form. He must bestow only such form as can arise from his own mind. Thus the essential demon arises from and is sustained by the natal demon. The natal demon or the intellectual experience providing the forms and appearances. Another way of approaching this is on the Greek level of ethics, where we have the same principle, and it is a very interesting and very important key which can be conveyed through many fields of thought. We have in uh, our thinking the famous story of the Good Samaritan, in which we have for us the most perfect, perhaps, simple, childlike example of charity. This to us, then, becomes charitas, which is little more nor less than brotherly love, and which we have now interpreted as a semi-voluntary process of dole, which has nothing to do with the original meaning at all. Uh, we give 
uh, we say, to charity. Because we think of charitable organizations. But actually, when we give to charity, the Greek says we give to charitas. We give to love. Because it is our love to give to love. We don't give to people. Because to them, love was a demon. A spiritual being. Resembling again your bodhisattvic and karmic and kamic deities in Buddhism. Where all principles are embodied in the tremendous pantheon of personalized energies. It is then in this way that through the concept of charity or the Good Samaritan, we have a symbol of our own instinct to give. Now this particular legend may have no meaning outside of our own experience. Whereas another, another nation seeking to express the same instinct will choose a different legend but one appropriate to its own instincts in the same general regard. One nation will draw a picture of a wise man as a person of great action, another as a person of infinite repose. These are according to the fashions of our experience and in clothing the impulses, instincts, and outpourings of the essential demon we instinctively and automatically within ourselves invest these with familiar forms so that we produce the appearances of many gods, all of which are our own fashionings around formless energies which we cannot conceive in a formless state because conception itself is basically opposed to formlessness. It is impossible to conceive that which is inconceivable. Therefore, that which is substantially inconceivable must be reduced and dressed in conceivable form before we can know that it exists. This process takes place automatically within us in the same way or with the same general alacrity that certain processes occurring within the optical structure of man result in sight, although the image we see outwardly is not as an image conveyed to the brain. Thus, something is constantly happening and this constant flowing of superior into inferior results in a constant embodying of formlessness by the apperceptive faculties of our own consciousness. This is uh, the problem of the overshadowing, as the ancients held, by certain inspirational deities. Plotinus tells us, for example, the great Neoplatonist, that only on a few and certain occasions was he permitted to be raised up into communion and into the consciousness of his God. This is the God to whom he prayed and who ever listened to his prayer. This was the God who could hear him, though ten million prayed at once. And it was because of the mystery of this God that all who pray everywhere will be heard and each will be rewarded according to his works. This to the Greeks implied the necessity of a kind of machinery in which these prayers did not ascend abstractly in space to some one remote source there to be filtered, evaluated, and measured, but that it was necessary only for man to call upon those deific attributes which were forever part of his own anthropos or over self, forever available to him and related to him as Krishna is related to Arjuna in the famous scene on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Thus, to call upon the God, to call upon the name of the God is to be heard because it means that by attitude, by consecration, by purification, by dedication, the individual is opening the channels with his own divine nature, making it possible for that nature to flow in upon him in all emergency and in all great periods or moments of mystical identity. This identity is union with the anthropos or the essential demon. The thought has been contemplated becomes less startling as we think, but in the beginning it is rather to be considered as unusual. Now we are told, for example, 
that man's ascent consists of a certain order of conquests, and that these conquests are related to and similar to the rituals of initiation into the state mysteries. For initiation is divided into a lesser and greater rite, as in the, as in the rites at Eleusis. These greater and lesser rites consist, therefore, of the rites of the essential demon and the rites of the natal demon. On the altars uh, of the natal demon, man must make his first and natural offerings to the gods. And among the Greeks, all men freeborn or free, all children, all women freeborn or free, <coughs> all persons not convicted of some crime or offense against the gods might be initiated into the lesser mysteries, because these mysteries simply finally constituted the mysteries of birth, and that all individuals born into this world as free, and all men are born free except those that are in bondage to their own karma or to those unpaid debts by means of which they are unable to proceed in the enlightenment and elevation of their own natures. All free persons are therefore of all ages allowed to be present and to participate in the lesser rites. These lesser rites, therefore, relate to the mystery of the restoration of the natal demon the ability of the individual to become in all things worthy of the natural faculties and abilities with which he has come to identify his own life. These include the duties of citizenship, the duties of family, the duties of the honorable maintenance of economic estate, the duties of sharing, participating, defending with honor, protecting, uh, the duties of such natural improvements and growths as may be possible, and those duties which particularly appertain to the development of such latent and natural aptitudes as we know that we possess. For if these attributes and aptitudes be properly developed, they become ornaments, they become altars, by means of which we are able to make additional and nobler sacrifices in the honor of our gods. These things, then, are the individual coming to the common state of things, coming to that problem or to that condition which we might say that, behold, we have here the honorable person. We have what uh, Confucius might term the superior man, who is simply one who is superior to the performance of an inferior action. He cannot be made to do that which is not good. This is the lesser mystery. And by means of it, man gains an ascendancy over his natal demon. He gains union, therefore, with the least of these tutelary divinities. And he makes the important discovery that he is a god. He makes the important discovery that a spark of the eternal is within him. That therefore, he is a sleeping God until he awakes. And he is a God unknowing his own Godhood until he becomes aware thereof. And by means of the ascent, uh, nature of the natal demon, he is brought to the point where he realizes that the power to think the power and courage to do. All of these things spark finally from the highest attribute of the natal demon, which is the will. For out of the apperception of things as they are comes the will to do those things which are necessary. So the natal demon supplies the will motivation by means of which man conquers this world or is deficient in such conquest, and therefore fails in his, problem, uh, his proper achievement. In the wanderings of Odysseus, as Apuleius tells us in his essay on the cave of the nymphs, in the wanderings of Ulysses or Odysseus, 
the natal demon is represented by the cyclop. Inasmuch as the cyclop or the titanic cell, the compound structure of the mind, the one-eyed guardian, who remains dangerous until the stake is driven through its eye, represents the ego, which remains dangerous until the stake is driven through the ego or it is deprived of its authority, the ego being really a term synonymous with I or selfness or selfhood. Now, we might say that it sounds rather unpleasant that we have worked up such a nice account of what a pleasant uh, being the natal demon is, only to learn that it is a nasty old cyclop. <laughs> but let us also remember that at the time of this particular occasion, Ulysses was going somewhere, and he was very, very anxious to get there. And because of certain deeds and actions which had long previously been performed, Ulysses, or Odysseus, had brought down upon himself the wrath or antagonism of Poseidon, lord of the sea. He would have had no trouble with poor Ulysses, with the Cyclop, had he not been on a journey and in this journey, he was brought under the hazard of the cyclop as one of the twelve tests which make up the story of the Odyssey. The natal demon is exactly then the combination of the Greek thought and the Buddhistic thought. When man has reached identity with intellect, he comes to the most dangerous point in his entire development as a being. When he is less than intellect, he is less than self. When he is intellect alone, he is less than nothing. And it is a peculiar situation. Because the mind, when permitted as the essential, as the natal demon, to obsess or to take over those privileges and prerogatives which belong to a superior power, then changes from a guardian to a tyrant. A man who has first had to rise above the inconstancies and inconsistencies of the flesh, in effort to unite himself with his mind, must now rise above the more treacherous, cruel, and terrible dangers of the mind, in order to proceed therefrom toward identity with the essential demon. This we will get a little later as we approach the next phase of our problem. But here we see man's struggle toward a mystical at one month, or unification with the over-self. The over-self now being a personalized <coughs> concept of the true nature of God. Personalized not necessarily uh, merely as the worship of another human being, but personalized in the sense that we personalize deity in art. Not because we believe actually that God looks like the elderly gentleman on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, but because in this form we give a venerable, we give a majestic similitude to that which we essentially know to be formless. It becomes a convenient symbol. Now, internally, we live likewise in a world of symbols. And when we reach union with the essential demon, we work or achieve union with the most exalted symbol by which we can objectively cognize or contemplate that which in its substance is beyond cognition or contemplation. So the essential demon represents the vague yet majestic form by which we attempt to portray that which sur supersedes or is superior to all known other forms. 
It is good, better than all the good that we know, but still bound in the basic concept of good. It is wisdom wiser than the wisdom of all mortals, yet held within the framework of the concept of wisdom. It is law, more honorable, more perfect, more just, more universal than any law that we can conceive of, yet we conceive of it as law, although it transcends. We have to use this essential concept. And these concepts, retiring from the obvious to the subtle, become archetypal. And as archetypal concepts, we express them as divinities. That was the basic concept of the original Greek theology. Now the second point, we've carried our little story of the godlings for a moment about as far as we can because we have to combine this now with another entirely different uh, group of uh, patterns. The Greeks had a philosophy of images. This philosophy of images also did not die with them. It took a certain change of color and appearance and survived into Christianity very largely in the perfusion of religious images which have adorned uh, the churches of Europe for, uh, for nearly 2,000 years. These images are venerable, but according to the mind of the church, they are not sacred. They are venerable, but not sacred. They are sacred in the sense that to profane them, or to injure them, to destroy them, to mutilate them, would be an act of impiety to the uh, principle for which they stand. But the images per se and of themselves are for the most part not regarded to have a particular virtue unless that virtue is communicated to them by the presence of holy relics. If the image is a reliquary to contain certain sacred remains, then those remains may also have a further sanctity, as of course in the uh, remains or relics of saints. Uh, and canonization in the church usually involves uh, or requires the evidence of miraculous intercession as the result of relics or prayers or of other means by which the assistance of the sanctified person has been requested or uh, supplicated. Now the Greeks have also, or did have, a concept of images. And it is quite useless for us to assume that they worship their statues of Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon any more uh, than the American Indians. I've talked to the old medicine priest down where they make the little kachinas and all the little sacred images. They tell you definitely they do not worship these. They are not gods, but they are similitudes. They are like oriental mandalas. They are visible things which cause us to remember invisible things causing us to bring to mind or to restore out of the depth of thought or memory certain truths, principles, ideals, or realities which might otherwise not be immediately accessible to us. The Greeks went a little further, however, than this. They declared, following Pythagoras and the Egyptians, that all forms in nature are in sympathetic relationship to similar forms. That forms of a kind or of a type sanctified under a circumstance or condition have natural and peculiar virtues because of similitude. Paracelsus developed this very intensely in his theory of sympathies and antipathies. When, therefore, the conqueror Xerxes 
entered the great temple of the Olympian Zeus and stood in the presence of the magnificent statue of gold with a face of ivory and crowned with a wreath of olive and bearing in one upraised hand the gilded ivory figure, figure of victory. The great conqueror, looking up 30 feet above him into the face of this deity, suddenly fell on his knees and relented his previous determination of destroying the sanctuary. He went quietly therefrom and ordered that it should not be disturbed. Now the Greek says to us, the image is ivory, trimmed neatly with gold. We know the man who carved it. We know that it is inanimate. We know that of itself it is a but a gilded earth. But what caused Xerxes to change his mind? That's the question. Had this image been different, would the conqueror still have paused? If a man had come up and told him certain truths, would he have let that man speak, or would he have slain him before he could have uttered the words? What was it that stopped Xerxes? Psychologically, the answer is rather obvious. Sublimity. Xerxes was overwhelmed, as we are often overwhelmed, in the presence of extraordinary majesty, great beauty, of wonderful ritual or ceremony. Whether we are converted to its processes or not, we are still moved by the impact of the dynamic solemnity and majesty of the occasion. What is this? What is this impact? What is majesty? What is sublimity? It is the presentation by the great conception of art, whether visible or musical. It can be musical. Of archetypal form. Substance superior to its elements had they not been so united in that form and confirmation. Thus, according to the Greeks, Zeus, who is not a person, but represents the archetype of these attributes of beauty, order, power, authority, dominion, law, order, number, that Zeus, therefore, is captured, not as a person who will speak through the lips of the image, but as a power, remote in space, but proximate in all things similar to itself. For as surely as God as life is revealed through everything that lives, as surely as God as generation is revealed in all things generate, as truly as God in tr as truth is revealed in all things essentially factual and substan substantially true. So all virtues in themselves distant, invisible, and intangible are curiously captured and held by their similitudes and by their natural forms and orders. This carries us, then, to the reason for a talk about Zeus, which is not our main subject, but to bring us back for a moment to a statement in the Bible. And God created man in his own image. Now this is our point. The great Zeus of Phidias is a sublime body artistically conceived in the similitude of a deity. Man is a divine body, <coughs> creatively fashioned in the similitude of a divine being. And if the sublimity which attached itself to the Olympian Zeus brings with it a certain sympathy, then man, in all his composite nature, 
in all of the symmetry and dynamic of his structure, in all the magnificence and order of his functions, in all the gallantry and beauty of his potentials. This being also cannot be remote from or separate from those principles which are personified and embodied by itself. Therefore man likewise, as an image of divine things, by the nature and proper constitution of his soul, is a habitation of divine things, to use the Greek term. Therefore there can be no essential interval between God and that similitude of God which is man or creation, with man as one of the most perfect geometrically obvious examples of the wisdom and dynamic and the canon of divine creation. This causes man to stand in a certain relationship to the gods. This relationship was very important in Greek religion. If therefore man is so constituted that he may be a receptacle of divine energies, if he is therefore likewise capable in his own life and nature of bearing witness to the attributes of deity, we will then pause for just a second and go back to our Olympian family. Here we have the gods up on the mountain, and these Olympian deities are twelve in number. These twelve representing to the Greeks the primary dodecahedron, or the great twelve-faced symmetrical solid, representing symbolically, and we might almost say in terms of a mandala, the perfect order, the perfect balance, the perfect interplay, the perfect geometrical harmony of the total divine power. This power, one in essence, twelvefold in manifestation, therefore manifests through archetypal qualities. Each of these qualities being basic or essential in nature one of the twelve creating powers which the Greeks and Romans later associated with the zodiac, or the twelve great orders of archetypal creative energies. It would follow, according to the Greeks, therefore, that if these twelve principles, existing universally in their own light, but existing archetypally as twelve fountains, cores, vortices, centers of creativity, that these extended principles moving toward generation or moving towards productivity would present twelve archetypal forms referred to by Plotinus as effulgent blossoms suspended in space. Such being the case, we then follow the Greek thinking that these twelve produce from themselves twelve kinds of souls, not greater nor less than each other, but possessing a peculiarity, namely that their perfection is by the dominant perfection of a certain power, a certain virtue, and that their harmony, their adjustment, their integration, their organization, these things are brought about by their ascendancy toward and unity with the creative principle from which they are dependent and to which they essentially belong and over whom this principle abides as the shepherd or psychopompus of an order of souls. 
The Greeks therefore declared that in complete spiritual democratic equality, man possessing attributes divine, but at the same time by his very nature, not complete or total in all his parts, may therefore be regarded as being suspended from certain deities, and that these deities are his fathers, that he is their child, that they are his father stars, that they are the causes and proper sources of himself, that his involution is departure from the knowledge or realization of this into a state of darkness or ignorance of his own origin. And evolution is his restoration again to identity with the shining vortex of the principle which is the core principle of his own nature. This means, or meant to the Greeks, therefore, that man belonged to orders or kinds, so that all men, while able to become physicians, would not become physicians by choice. For one man would choose to be artist, another architect, another physician. In the course of his evolution, and in the course of rebirth, he may become all of them. But even so accomplishing and so becoming, there still remains within himself a parent choosing a core of desire by means of which there is one universal aspect of the good which curiously invites him more than others and by which he is most stimulated to the attainment of the good. Therefore in the end instead of all persons or beings becoming alike they will return to a twelve-fold hierarchy to be available for the further manifestation of orderly diversity in nature, but not deficient in any of their own parts. The Greeks firmly believed this. They believed, therefore, that while we all have an equal destiny, that we all have a kind of destiny of divine and perfect accord, we are by nature inclined to a certain diversity of equality, and that while we may all gain philosophic insight, some will not choose to return home by philosophy alone. They will choose another road. One will become true to his father's star through the healing of the sick, another through the building of a house for his neighbor, another still by mastering the mysteries of the sea, still another by pertaining, uh, pertaining to great oratory and art, each one in his own way, fulfilling the peculiar core purpose of himself but discovering that this core purpose cannot be accomplished without the assistance of the attendant muses or godlings, which represent all other powers necessary to the completeness of the dodecahedron. In other words, in each person, eleven powers cooperate to perfect a twelfth. They become the servants of it. There are twelve possible cores each of these cores surrounded by the other eleven, so that each individual, by all paths and methods, still leads to a peculiar central focus of himself, and that this central focus, therefore, brings him home to one of the gods, brings him home to one of the great powers that are not deities in person, but are the great archetypal patterns by means of which life is precipitated into the state of existence. Each person then has a pattern, a keynote, a tone, a color, a vibration, by which he has a certain uniqueness. But this is not inequality. This is variety in unity. 
If therefore man, becoming embodied in this world, begins to aspire towards a superior state, he may then, under certain conditions, seek to achieve beyond the common achievement of his time, pressed on by inevitable fate, by providence, one of the most powerful of all archetypes. Pressed on by these considerations, the individual immediately seeks identity with the natal demon. He cannot rest until he has achieved the most that his nature permits. Another man beside him has no such unrest and will continue for an indefinite time to live according to a series of compromises. Each person, however, even at the beginning of his search, will be first pressed to this quest by something in particular. For he will not move until the quality which belongs to his father star is moved in him. One man, therefore, will discover this pressing move on a battlefield. Another will experience it in parenthood. A third in art. Another in medicine. Whatever these symbols may be, there is always one door that opens into the mysterious and fabulous many-gated temple of Thebes. There are an infinite number of gates but each man must enter by one. Also, there are twelve gates in the holy city of the New Jerusalem, so that the twelve orders of souls may come in, and the tree of life and the tree for the healing of the nations bears twelve kinds of fruit that no souls may go hungry. The thought has been carried on through, but we've lost track of it, because nobody bothered to think what these symbols might imply. If therefore the soul or the mind comes therefore finally to the union with the essential demon, and then gradually by the various disciplines ascends to the rational power, attaining perhaps the nature of the essential demon, it then stands like the ancient archangel upon the clouds looking out upon eternity. For man having completed the possibilities of the reflective life has gone as far as certain elements or factors of his nature will permit. It is then that there is left to him only that which is beyond himself. And it is then and then only that according to the rituals and the rites, man is placed upon the beginning of the great road that leads from what we might term personality directly to principle. And this road is the journey. It is the dark night of the soul, this journey of St. John of the Cross. It is many mystical experiences. It is likewise the mysterious road of St. Hildegard of Bingen, whose strange and wonderful symbols were beyond the contemplation of the centuries in which she lived. But here comes the new equation. In the Greek mythology it is said that under certain conditions the gods descend unto mortals, unite with mortals, and breed a race of heroes. Now the hero in the Greek is also a very interesting and compelling symbol, because in every instance it is the union of a principle with a body. It is furthermore the identity that we find in the statue of Zeus and the archetype behind it. 
the great conqueror could not have been moved had not the archetype taken form. And the form could not exist had the archetype not been projected. So the union of archetype and form is found in correlation or correspondence in the nature of man. For we know, as the Greeks tell us, that the hero is the immortal mortal. That the hero represents a divine archetype impressed upon matter. What then do we recognize this to be? We have discovered that the body bears such an impression. We have discovered that the senses, the faculties, the functions, the attributes, all bear witness to this impression. We know that the mind, the emotions, and the rational faculties bear witness, but these all bear witness to certain aspects only. The mind bears witness only to the sub-archetype of intellect, not to the total archetype. What then is the total archetype? What is the total impression of the divine purpose upon matter? And uh, the Greek said that this impression, the total impression of the archetype upon form in the generation of a compound complex being in whom actually or potentially are all the attributes of the archetype that this being is substantially invisible, but is nevertheless related intimately to and identical with, so far as such identity is possible, the personal and natural body of man. Man is therefore a being extending from the visible parts of the archetype, which are its inferior parts, to those invisible parts which are its superior and causal parts. And the total impact of the divine creative power upon the total man who therefore comes into existence as one being with infinite diversity within him but undivided, bearing witness to an archetype containing infinite diversity but undivided that the total impact of this is the union of a god and a mortal and the production of a hero. The hero, therefore, is nothing more or less than the total being, the total being of man. Not his mind alone, not his emotions alone, not his energies alone, not his contemplative mystical experiences alone, but the total visible and invisible spirituality, intellectuality, and physical existence of man, man totally, with every resource, every potential, in whose nature the twelve powers reside, and in the center or core of which one of these powers is sovereign over the others, forming with them a celestial order, a hierarchy, a hierarchy which in the process of man's evolution will gradually be externalized as a series of hierarchies and a series of archetypes, but which man in turn, by his own growth, will gradually move in upon until he becomes progressively aware of the twelvefold nature of himself and his own divine structure. The creature, therefore, the hero, is the total being as remarkable from the separate being, because the separate being is incapable of the heroic estate. The mind can go so far and must perish. The emotions go so far and then betray. The reason goes so far and then stands upon the borders of the unknown. Faith carries man beyond reason. A pure and complete Eastern concept of a somatic or nirvanic state carries man beyond faith. But still, he has no certainty that he has exhausted the archetype. He does not know that this archetype is other than that it is total being, as absolutely different from any part of itself, and yet 
complete in itself. That all parts become chemically dissolved in the production of a thing different from themselves, but containing them all and superior to themselves. So we have the hero. He is therefore like the story of every man. He is the total truth seeker. He exists for two purposes. First, that the way of God may be made known. That is the motion downward of the law. And the second thing is that he himself shall return to his father's house or return to the full statement of his own nature. By the descending of his own potential archetype in all its aspects, he gradually transforms himself into the living sanctuary or the ecclesia. He is the church and the worshiper as one. He is the priest, the congregation, the altar, and the deity, all in one, undivided, of which all congregations, priests, altars, and deities are man's attempt to objectify archetype. He creates around him the similitude of the eternity within him. And every time he looks upward in the search of God, he is facing the eternal Olympus. He can look in no other direction. Of these deities of which we wish to speak, therefore, we can choose a certain example. In the Greek legendary and law, among the most important of these archetypal heroic beings, uh, the most important to us, are such heroes as Jason, the father of the Argonautic expedition that was searching for the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece, of course, represents the, the skin of the celestial ram. It is also, of course, if we want to go still further in it, it is the symbol of life, of truth, of wisdom. But perhaps most of all, it is the way of the god Ars, who is the lord of this. Therefore, in the case of Jason, we have a hero ascending according to the hierarchy and archetype of ours, or Mars, going home through that path, searching for his father's star, which is the constellation of the ram. In this case, what does Jason do? Jason, having built his ship, and having resolved upon the great Argonautic expedition, seeks around him for the noblest and most valiant of the Grecians, and selects twelve who are to accompany him on the journey. And these are called the Argonauts. These twelve are archetypally the great circle of the gods. A little less archetypally and more within our own comprehension, they represent twelve powers resident in the human soul, the twelve attributes or energies by means of which the quest for the golden fleece is to be made possible. Therefore the expedition starts out, and it is rumored that in that expedition a very wonderful and mysterious being also accompanied them as one of the great heroes, and that being was obvious. And it is also told to us that Minerva assisted in the expedition, all of these representing the attributes of the psychic self and of the archetypal world, uniting in the hero quest. So, our, so Jason becomes the individual who, moving from the lesser to the greater rites of the mysteries, faces the great division of the Eleusinia into twelve degrees, through which the great labors must be performed, which are again paralleled by the other solar hero, Hercules, 
who is the hero of the order of the god Apollo. Now in the Greeks, when the priests in the temple, by their methods, which we do not fully comprehend nor know their means today, anointed an infant into the mysteries, for the newborn babe was also consecrated, these priests are said to have given to this child its sacred name, the name which might not be used in the reference to the child, a name which must be earned. The American Indian had the same habit. But that this name was actually the key to his father's star, so that physically he might be the son of, uh, might be some Roman like the son of Glaucus or Claudius. But in the temple, he was the son of Hermes, or of Zeus, or of Juno, or of whichever of the orders of deities his father archetype belonged. For as a person, he was born of the earth, but as a hero, as a total being, he was the child of heaven always. His body might come and go, he might live a thousand embodiments. But still he was the son of the Father God to whom he was indebted for the archetypal impulse. Therefore we understand perhaps why the Emperor Julian so always declared that he was the son of Mercury. This was because of the fact that he was an initiate of the mysteries of the great Oriental Diana of Ephesus and had received the mystery of his star or archetypal identity. And the Greek uses the word star in two ways, not only to symbolize astrology, but rather effectively archetype, because your star form, your magnificent blazing crystalline pattern, like a snowflake, is a beautiful symbol, a pure archetype. It is about as near as we can come to it. So these were the star archetypes which perhaps blazed in the invisible heavens of the gods as flowers upon the meadows of the sky. And the Greek poets so referred to them. The most famous, of course, of all the heroes is Ulysses or Odysseus, who belonged to the celestial archetype of Poseidon, lord of the sea. Therefore, when Ulysses began his journey home from the Trojan War in the plains of Ilium. We know that the ancient name of Troy was Ilium, from Elus, meaning mud, earth, slime. Here is the, the same meaning as the parable son of the prodigal son and his flesh pots of Egypt, also the archetypal symbol of mortal or physical existence. That when he started to return home. Ulysses, or Odysseus, had to pay his debt to Poseidon, his father's star. In other words, this star, for his return journey, became his judge, because nothing might be accepted back into the archetype except that which was consistent with the archetype. Any fault failing or weakness against the archetype became a peril. And this peril had to be met. And this peril, like the labors of Hercules, is represented by one of the adventures along the way. One of the temptations, for all these temptations are simply symbols of the initiatory ritual, which in turn is the symbol of the evolution of the hero self. Now the hero self, having gone along through some of these testings, seems to come under most evil times. And in the case of Ulysses, who started out with a considerable company, representing attributes, qualities, achievements, and attainments, finds that in the end he must proceed alone. For all things not pertaining to the hero self are lost along the way, although we start with them. 
and the hero self comes finally home uh, to Penelope, who is weaving the mysterious tapestry of fate. A tapestry which she unravels at night and weaves again the next day to keep away the false suitors until her lord can return. Now, of course, in this case, Penelope represents one of the primary attributes of the higher archetype. She is Sophia, she is the mysterious Helen of Gator's Faust, she is the blessed damosel, she is Dante's Beatrice, who finally leads him into the Paradiso. She represents the highest aspects of his own now immortalized soul to which he returns. It is for this reason that Plotinus, writing to his friend, congratulates this friend because his son has come to study with him. And Plotinus says he rejoices that this young man has resolved to make philosophy his journey, and that he also, like Ulysses, seeks to spread the sail of his little ship and return to his own far distant native land. This is the journey of the hero. The hero, therefore, represents the immortal mortal. He represents the mysterious image with feet of clay and head of gold. He represents this mysterious being upon whom both heaven and earth turn like wolves upon a helpless being, apparently to rend that helplessness to shreds. And yet, by the continuous and marvelous intervention of the deities themselves, the hero is miraculously preserved until his labor is accomplished, always assuming, however, the sincerity of his own purpose and his own desire. Now, another point that is interesting in connection with the heroic legend is that in the majority of instances, or in many instances at least, the hero comes like Hercules to a tragic end. Now this is true not only in the hero myths of the Greeks, but in the hero myths of most all peoples, because the whole strange world upon which men build, and which must ultimately be strangely shattered by restoration to archetype, is always a mortal, immortal world. The hero is never faultless. The hero is never quite wise enough. He is uh, wiser than most, but falls victim to the strangest and most inconstant and inconsistent confusions, which is again perfectly natural to this state, because the hero moving is a being imperfect, trying to move beyond itself, trying always to achieve the unachieved, and therefore having no guide, and usually moving only upon emergency, surviving against the tremendous pressure of adversity. Now the hero in the Greek is honored in various ways, usually by ultimate identity with the deities, and sometimes being returned as a constellation, a star or a heavenly body which simply means restoration to archetype, becoming a star in the internal heaven of causes, and where it's returned to archetype. But in this mystery also, the Greeks were fully aware of the Oriental concept that the journey home is not only according to a law, but it is a journey from fragmentary existence to total existence and that along the way of that journey to total existence, there must at one point, usually at the critical point, there must be an extraordinary change in events. Man moving toward totality reaches the point where totality begins to impress itself upon partial existence. The impact of these two things upon each other is very largely a matter of concern 
at least symbolic concern, to the ascending being. Actually, this concern is from perspective only, inasmuch as Hercules dies. But Hercules is again restored and is carried back to the gods, where he becomes forever a great and venerable hero. He passes through death into immortality. But instead of passing through death into the darkness of earth to be reborn again, he now passes on into the celestial abodes and no longer is numbered with those who die. In this case, of course, the attainment of this immortality, implying as it does the attainment of a total impartial existence, that is, a, an existence without division, goes back to your Pythagorean mathematics. All things in which division exists are mortal. All things in which there are parts are susceptible to the rearrangement of those parts. Also, all things which exist in part have partile consciousness. And that is the only consciousness we know. We have a consciousness that exists not because of the fullness of itself, but because it is a specialization within an area of unconsciousness. Therefore, the heroic state actually means the individual transcending consciousness as he knows it, because the consciousness as he knows it is fragmentary. This is your Buddhistic nirvana. This is the extinction of the self. Unless the seed shall die, it shall not live again. This is the real mystery of the crucifixion and the resurrection. That all things, including the hero, must die. Because that which dies is the partile self. It is said in the ancient wisdom of, the, of Israel that Moses ascended to the 49 gates, but the 50th gate he could not pass. And because he had angered the Lord by the smiting of a rock, when the time came, he was not permitted to enter into the land of Canaan, but was allowed to stand upon a mountain and look forth upon the land of Canaan. But Jehoshua, the son of Nun, led the children of Israel into the promised land. And upon the mountain, Moses, the hero, died and was taken to his God. And because God had promised that the angel of death should never come unto Moses, God came himself and took him. Now Moses is the hero, but the hero must die upon the hill of Moab because another leader must carry the twelve tribes, the twelve parts, the twelve gods, the twelve departments of the soul on into the nirvana or into the total archetype. So the hero may approach the eternal but can never know it. And the reason why the hero can never know the eternal is because the eternal may know only itself and no other thing may know it. So there is this moment in which the self and all the attributes of its own nature, crucified between its own polarities, must die. And by so dying, save the whole world, the total self and the total being. Archetypally, this is the Logos of Plato, which impresses itself upon the universe in the beginning, in the form of the cross, and by dying at the time of creation, makes possible the redemption of all things. The Greeks had precisely the same concept, but the going home to the Greek, being the restoration of totality, meant the entry into an eternal, unconditioned state beyond mind or thought or concept, in which the personal self, the hero self, the attained self, 
perishes along with the unattained. And in the great battle of the gods in the Nordic literature, the gods and the evil spirits in the last great battle slew each other and all died together. Therefore, the hero self, the lower self, uh, the demon, natal, and the sensual, all these finally come into a strange dissolution, for they are fragments. And the concept, the existence, the being of fragment ceases when totality exists. So all parts die in totality. And in trying to preserve themselves, they preserve their own isolation and their own suffering. But in the complete sacrifice of themselves, they attain all. And those who would save their lives, lose them. And those who lose their lives for the sake of truth, shall have life everlasting. And it is this loss of life in truth that brings with it ultimately the restoration and resurrection of the firstborn of them that sleep. It is a it is a very great mystery, but the Greeks were well aware of it. So now we have perhaps an understanding of Aesop's famous definition of the labor of the gods. Namely, that they are concerned principally with the raising up of the humble and the casting down of the great. The casting down of the great being, of course, the involutionary procedure in which that which was high, which was noble, which was archetypal, is reduced to the most humble state. And then the restoration or elevation of the meek being the lifting up of those from the earth through the restoration of this golden ladder or the great chain by which Zeus bound the world to the pinnacle of Olympus. All these legends and fables, therefore, have their own peculiar, rich significance. And to us in our present century, the simple thought that we are the hero, that we are the ones who are performing the labors, that our life is an expedition of Argonauts, that our wandering against the buffetings of the sea is our meeting the death of Poseidon, lord of the deep, whose great purpose is to bring us home to himself, that actually the sorrows we pass through, the miseries we face, the burdens we carry, are simply those expressions forever reminding us that we are out of harmony with archetype. That which cannot fit into the eternal must be cast from it. As the Dionysian artificers, who first before the stone could fit into the house, had to square it and perfect it, and remove all parts by which it was not suitable to be brought into union with other stones of similar purpose. So that the archetypal struggle that we know, the daily battle, is simply the individual removing those factors from his consciousness or from his experience by which he cannot go home. And these are removed in many ways. Uh, by Socrates and Plato, the concept was a joyous removal. removal. And by others, it is a painful procedure. For the difference between wisdom and ignorance is that wise men love to do what fools are forced to do. There is no change in the order of things. But by gallantly, gallantly understanding, and by relinquishing error without stress, by relieving ourselves of the tendency to defend our mistakes, but to move naturally and sequentially according to the order of our gods. Each soul returns to its father star according to the Greek pattern. And in the golden eras to come, beyond the contemplation of mortal men, all the heroes and all the great principles will feast together in the eternal field of the blessed. This, of course, is the field of the stars, the great universal mystery. 
For the stars are the symbols of archetypes, and the invisible universe is starred with them. For everywhere in space there are sunbursts of law unfolding and growing. And as these take form, they become worlds. And as these formed worlds release themselves from forms, they become souls. And when the release is sufficient, they become heroes. When the release is perfect, they become gods. And becoming gods discover their identity with the great archetype rather than a separate existence in space. This, uh, this concept, I think, is a brief summary of the Greek theology on that matter and how that is taken or was taken and mystically employed to create a philosophical system of disciplines will be, of course, the subject of the final lecture of this series uh, next week on the same evening. And we thank you for being here.